In this lesson, we'll review the concept of a linear system, and we'll introduce an approach to sampling a linear system, and show how to apply this approach for a system that is characterized by a first-order differential equation. Well, in general, a system is a mechanism for transforming one signal to another. A voltage signal applied to some part of a circuit, for instance, might cause a current to change in some other part. Or a voice signal applied to a cell phone's microphone might cause a sound signal to come out of another phone's speaker thousands of miles away. In general, we typically associate some signal as the system input and another signal as the system output. In this diagram, for example, the signal x of t is the input and the signal y of t is the output. Determining the output y of t that will be caused by some known input x of t for a system is often called a forward problem, whereas determining the input x of t that caused some known output y of t is called an inverse problem. In general, inverse problems are more difficult than forward problems. Well, there are many ways to classify systems, but one of the most important is linear versus nonlinear. Linear systems are characterized by two properties, scaling and superposition. Scaling, for instance, means that if we double the input, we double the output. Or if we have the input, we have the output. Superposition means that if the input is the superposition of two or more signals, then the output will be the superposition of their individual outputs. Now any system that has the scaling and superposition properties is linear, and any system that is linear will have these properties. One of the ways we describe the input-output relationship for a linear system is through a superposition integral with some kernel h of t and tau. And that's the response of the system at some time t when the input is an impulse at some time tau. Another way is through a pth order differential equation with some constant coefficients a sub p. Now this system is characterized by its order, capital P, and by the coefficients a sub p. Well, let's suppose that we sample the input to a linear system relative to some basis phi sub k. Now if this signal is input to a linear system, then the output of the system will be the superposition of the responses for each of the basis functions. Now if we've characterized the system by its impulse response, then re the relationship between those two bases will be found through the superposition integral. And if we've characterized the system by a differential equation, then we could use that differential equation to find the relationship between the two basis functions. Here for example is a rectangular basis function with width w. And if the system is characterized by a superposition integral with an impulse response that is a decaying exponential with some time constant, a, as might be the case for a capacitive circuit with a time constant a, then the output basis might look like this when the basis with w is 10 times the time constant a. And here's what the output basis might look like when the width w is only four times the time constant. Now using these bases for a forward problem would be smooth because the sampling of the input would be accomplished by the rect functions, which would be an orthogonal basis function, set of basis functions, and that'd be pretty straightforward to do the sampling. And then those coefficients could be used for the reconstruction of the output using these decaying, growing and decaying exponentials as the output basis. For an inverse problem though, we'd need to first sample the output relative to the output basis functions, and that'd be a bit more challenging because of the non-orthogonality of those basis functions and the, in general, infinite tail on these basis functions. Well, it turns out that the superposition system we've been discussing here with this exponential impulse response can also be represented by the following first-order differential equation. Now if we sample the input by a triangular basis of width w, then the basis for k equals 0 might look like this. 
And the derivative of that basis function multiplied by the coefficient a would look like this, where the height of this, these steps is plus and minus a over w. And that's because the derivative of a triangular function is a linear function. It has a constant derivative over both sides of the triangle. Then if we add those two components together, we'll get the shape for the fundamental basis function for the output. And here's what those functions would look like, for instance, for the sampling coefficient or sampling indices being minus 1, 0, and 1. Now like the input triangle bases, these functions aren't all orthogonal, but that's only for adjacent pairs of functions. So the only inner products that we need to use for sampling with these functions are the self inner products and the inner products for the nearest neighbors in each direction. As an example, let's suppose that we have a system that's described by a first order differential equation with a coefficient equal to 0 0.3. And then let's suppose we'd like to determine the input signal x of t that will produce the output that we've shown here, a rectangle function over the interval from 0 to 1. Of course, this result could be easily computed analytically, and we've done that in circuit classes, for instance. But the power of a method like this is for signals that are much more complicated. For instance, this one that has some decaying oscillations but we can still solve for the input signal estimate by first sampling the output signal. To summarize, the steps involved for solving a forward problem with linear systems are, first, we'll select the basis for the input signal. Now this should provide a good representation of the signal, but also allow for relatively easy analysis when it's passed through the system. Next, we pass the input basis functions through the system to determine the basis functions for the output signal. And part of the art of selecting a good input basis is to select one that will provide a good basis for the output signal, that is, one that provides a nice representation of the output. Next, we sample the input signal relative to its basis functions to determine the sampling coefficients, alpha k, for each of the input basis functions, phi sub k. Finally, we use those basis functions to construct the output signal relative to the output basis. Now, the advantage of sampling a system in this manner is that once we determine the output basis functions, determining the output signal for any input signal is a matter of sampling the input signal and constructing the output signal relative to the input and output bases. And by picking the input basis wisely, this will be much easier than trying to directly analyze the output for some arbitrary input. The steps for an inverse problem, the first two steps are the same. First select a basis for the input, then determine the corresponding outputs for each basis function. Again, this analysis depends on the wise choice for the input basis functions, and this is part of the art of using this powerful method for systems analysis. Now because for an inverse problem we know the output, the next step is to evaluate the sampling coefficients for the output signal relative to the output basis functions. For this reason, it's important that we select an input basis that results in an output basis that lends itself to easy sampling of the output signal. Finally, we use the output sampling coefficients with the input sampling basis to construct the input signal. So whether we are solving a forward or inverse problem for linear system, the method of sampling is a powerful method that we'll explore in great detail in subsequent lessons.